Do you know if the COVID vaccine is a one-time injection or will it be an annual shot like a flu vaccination? The Pfizer vaccine will be at two injections, uh, one on day one, and then the next one will be on day 21. But whether or not you'll need annual vaccination is not clear yet. We don't know about how durable the antibody response is going to be over long periods of time. At this point, there is, there is not a recommendation for repeated vaccination. So currently, the only recommendation is to get the one series and that's it. Does the vaccine work for mutations because it targets the spikes or will there be subsequent versions like the flu shot? We know currently the vaccine uh, that is developed is appropriate for any strain of the COVID virus that has been that people have been exposed to over the last year. So as far as we know, the vaccine is adequate for any type of any type of COVID-19 strain. Is it a prevention vaccine or will it aid in the curing process for someone that has contracted the virus? So the purpose of vaccines is to prevent illness. And in this case, the purpose of the vaccine, again, is to prevent uh, acquiring the COVID infection. So what the study showed is that people who received the vaccine were less likely to acquire COVID disease than those who received the placebo. It has not established whether you're unlikely or impossible to transmit the virus. But you're, what, what it has shown is that you're less likely to develop any COVID-related illness. How long will the immunity provided by the vaccine last? So it's unclear how long the immunity lasts because uh, the studies of the patients who received the vaccine have only been performed after uh, only recently in the last few months. So we don't have any follow-up data, for example, for a year to see whether the patients continue to have durable immunity. And this means both doing serological tests, in other words, checking their blood for antibodies to the virus, and actual infections, so checking whether they actually res- under- re- experience a second infection after receiving the, vi- uh, the vaccine. So we don't know yet how long the effect lasts. Has this vaccine been tested on children? Are the side effects the same for children and adults? Most Recently, the only vaccine that has recently been approved, the Pfizer vaccine, the studies included individuals who are 16 years of age or older. We don't have data on people who are younger than that. Um, They state that there will be ongoing studies of those individuals as well in the future. So we do not yet know whether the side effect profile is the same for children as it is for adults. What standards or criteria have to be met before a vaccine is deemed safe for the public What is the minimum duration of testing that vaccines must go through before being deemed safe? And was this COVID vaccine fast-tracked? That's a question we've we've received a couple of times, how long it took to approve this vaccine. So certainly the process and the time it took to approve the vaccine in this case was much faster than usual. Um, But it has gone through all the phases of testing. Uh, Phase one, to make sure that it's safe on the initial investigation. Phase two, to make sure that it works Uh, with a small group of people and phase three to make sure that it works better than a placebo on a large scale of study. So even though it was quickly approved, the data so far and the follow-up data of the patients who have been vaccinated suggest that it is safe and uh, effective against the vaccine, against the virus. The mortality rate for COVID is low. Why would I take my chances with a vaccine that doesn't have long-term evidence to deem it safe? Based on the current evidence we have, the the side effects associated with the vaccine are very minimal and transient. In other words, we don't know of any long-term or permanent side effects associated with the vaccine. However, the mortality with COVID is substantial and also is associated with long-term complications. So the vaccine is certainly advisable given those, given that set of risk factors, uh, sorry, the, given that set of side effects that we know of from the disease and from the vaccine. The benefits of the vaccine are very clearly far outweigh any risks associated with the vaccine. And they far outweigh, uh, they, given the, the risks associated with COVID, certainly the vaccine is recommended. How do we know the vaccine won't affect fertility or cause birth defects, especially if they're not even giving it to pregnant women? That's alarming to me. That's what somebody just asked. There isn't any specific reason to be concerned about fertility when it comes to the vaccine. Um, some of these this types of vaccine have been already been used in the past in uh, very limited studies on other infectious diseases. None of those vaccines have ever come to market, so we don't have a definitive answer to that question. But again, if you look at the contents of the vaccine, None of, those, none of the contents of the vaccine are known to be harmful to the fetus or harmful to people in terms of fertility. So based on that information, it appears unlikely that people are going to experience any fertility issues if they're exposed to the vaccine. What is the allergen in the vaccine that is causing the anaphylactic reactions? 
One of the uh, contents of the vaccine, a lipid or fat product that is used to help stabilize it is called polyethylene glycol. This is actually a medic, this is part of a medic, uh, sorry, it's a ingredient that's found in other medications. In, it itself is actually a medication you could take for, uh, to, do, to induce uh, diarrhea, for example, it's a laxative. That, uh, that lipid has been occasionally documented to cause uh, reactions in people, allergic reactions but it is rare. So it is likely that most people will be able to tolerate the vaccine. Since the vaccine uses your own immune system to build up antibodies, will it work in people who have compromised immune systems? Yeah, like all vaccines, uh, they rely on your immune system to be able to fight off or generate a response so that if you are exposed to the virus, you'll be able to fight it off. So it's important to recognize that in any individual, uh, there are two concepts to consider. One is the safety and the second is whether it's effective. We don't yet know the answer to both those questions in people who are immune compromised, but it certainly is possible that people with severely compromised immune systems will have a weaker response to the vaccine, but we do not yet know definitively where, whether that's the case. That information is based on prior vaccines of different types that have been used over many years, where we do know that vaccine vaccination is not as effective because people are not able to mount the immune response in that group. But we don't know whether that's going to be the same case here with a totally new type of vaccine. Can a person who is breastfeeding receive this vaccine? The Health Canada or the, um, the National Immunization Council does not recommend that people who are breastfeeding or pregnant to receive the vaccine, except in circumstances where they feel that the risks of COVID outweigh the risks associated with the vaccine. And when they mean the, when they mean the risks associated with the vaccine, they mean the unknown risks. So the trials that were looking at this vaccine did not examine women who are breastfeeding or pregnant. So this is something that should be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. In the United States, their federal bodies recommended use of the vaccine in those groups um, with a discussion with the patient, because in those cases, in, in the US, the prevalence of the disease is much higher. So the risks associated with the disease are felt to be higher than the potential risk associated with the vaccine in that it hasn't been studied uh, thoroughly yet. In the 1976 swine flu outbreak in the U.S., there was a small increase of a neurological disorder called GBS with the vaccination. Can something like this happen with this vaccine? What are the health risks people are taking by getting this COVID-19 vaccine? <laughs> yeah, the, the Guillain-Barre syndrome that's associated with that vaccine and other vaccines has not been noted with this vaccine. It, it's certainly, again, it's possible that people may react with this but we do not yet have evidence to suggest that that's the case. And this is based on the experience of tens of thousands of individuals who have already been vaccinated with, the vac with this uh, product uh, during the clinical trials. We should also add that now that vaccination has started over a wide range of individuals in the UK and the US, and will start in Canada as well, we will have more data very quickly about whether or not this reaction is common. So, we're going to have, we're going to accumulate a, a great deal amount of information over the course of several weeks as the hundreds or tens and tens of thousands of people are going to be vaccinated. Between Pfizer and Moderna, which vaccine is less invasive? Is there one that's better for a population over the other? So Pfizer is approved and uh, politicians are saying they're expecting Moderna to be approved also. Yes, yeah, so they're both equally invasive or should I say minimally invasive in the sense that it's simply an injection uh, into a muscle, just like we receive other vaccinations. So there isn't any reason to consider, to believe that one of them is less invasive than the other. In terms of its efficacy for certain groups, again, we don't yet know whether one is going to be better for certain groups than the other. The big difference from a practical point of view between the vaccines is that it's much easier to ship the Moderna vaccine and to transport it because it doesn't require the minus 80 freezers that the Pfizer vaccine requires. So from a medical point of view, there doesn't appear to be yet a significant difference in terms of efficacy among groups. But again, we'll know sooner uh, once we have more data around the use of these vaccines, which should happen fairly soon with the Moderna as well. We've already heard the warnings that people with severe allergies should not be getting this vaccine. Someone is asking uh, or saying that they do have severe allergy to sulfa drugs and worry about how this vaccine will impact them. Yeah, with the recommendation that was initially made in the UK for individuals who had severe allergies, they are generally referring to people who have very severe allergies to medications or food products, specifically those who require um, 
uh, EpiPens to be carried with them. If individuals have allergies to sulfa, one has to judge individually how severe their history of reaction is. If they are a very severe type of acute reaction that we call anaphylaxis, they may fall under the group where they would uh, have a discussion at least about whether the vaccine is indicated for them. But many people who have reactions to sulfa drugs are mild to moderate and are likely not to be contraindicated when receiving this vaccine. If any individual has any specific concerns, they should speak to their, uh, their care provider before getting the vaccine, and their care provider will have an in-depth discussion about the risks and benefits based on their own medical history. Does the vaccine have live germs in it? No, so uh, the vaccine only contains mRNA, uh, a little bit of fat and a little bit of sugar, and what the mRNA is, is kind of like a code for your body or for all, cell, all living things to know how to build proteins. So mRNA is made out of uh, what we call base pairs or nucleic acid. This is found organically in every single living thing. So there's no actual live germ. It just contains a little snippet of a genetic code. So there's no way that injection of this vaccine will lead to an infection because it simply doesn't contain uh, the genetics required to do that. You can't get COVID from it. That's right. So it only contains one protein that's coded for in the virus. So the, the virus has about 29,000 of these nucleic acids. The mRNA that we're getting injected for the vaccine only has a, su a very small subset of, those, of, the, of that genetic code. So in other words, it doesn't have the rest of it, which could be programmed to build a virus. Um, and even still, the, the way it's being delivered it is not a way where the virus could actually infect your respiratory cells. How many years of human safety trials do you recommend for new experimental vaccines to lower risk of serious side effects? I think when you judge whether or not um, a vaccine should be approved, it has to be done within the context of what that disease is causing. If we're seeing thousands upon thousands of people dying from the disease daily around the world, then the safety data has to be balanced against the risks associated with the virus itself. So. This is a decision that Health Canada and the FDA had to make about whether or not to approve that, uh, that vaccine. They had to make the decision very quickly and waiting many years for efficacy data would not have been deemed ethical in that case, given that many people are dying. And so the data at this stage, the safety data and the efficacy data were convincing enough that they did go ahead and approve it. In an ideal world, we would have many years of observations before approving things, but this can't, this can't be done in this case where the virus is um, causing such significant effects on the population. At what point, I mean, we know that some people have been left out of the clinical trials and these trials usually include, you know, some of the most healthiest people participating. At yeah. what point and how do we determine that these vaccines are safe for everyone if uh, segments of the populations were left out of the clinical trials? So the, the two ways that we will be able to determine that, one is that the, the people who are making the trial, people who are producing the vaccine may specifically study those populations in a future trial. The second is that in the real world, it is likely that some of these populations will get vaccinated. Specifically, I'm referring to pregnant and breastfeeding individuals. Um, in the US, for example, Brazil, where there's a high rates of COVID, it is likely that the risks associated with the disease are higher than the risks associated with the vaccine. So many pregnant women will be vaccinated, and then we will have uh, observational data that can help guide us. Similarly, a lot of different individuals with various immunosuppressive conditions, of which there are a wide variety, will also get vaccinated. And with that data, with that knowledge, it'll help us understand how effective the vaccine is and how safe the vaccine in that population is too. So the second part is that there will be real world data for people to look at. By the time that there's universal uh, vaccinations happening here in Canada, um, how much more will we know about these vaccines? We, yeah, in the next uh, month or two, we will have a significant amount of data. Like if you look at the numbers in the United States, they are vaccinating several thousand people in today. So we're going to get uh, that data on tens of thousands of people over the next four to six, you know, eight weeks or so. The goal of the federal government is to vaccinate approximately three million people over the next four months. So. Uh, that's going to be in a, in a uh, prioritized kind of hierarchical approach to, to, to based on your risk. So even that data from Canada will be very helpful. So we're going to get data on tens of thousands of individuals very quickly. How long does the vaccine stay in your system? 
Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure exactly how long the actual particles stay. It, it, it can't be very long because mRNA is very rapidly degraded by the body. So I, I would guess in the range of hours to maybe a day, but I'm not, I'm not, I can't be confident that's only just a guess. Yeah. But I would say that it's not going to last days because these are all organic materials. And what we know of previous viruses and virus viral vaccinations, they are very rapidly cleared from the body. So your body will take up the vaccine and likely have a response. Um, we know based on the trial within a week or so. When, when people, the reason I ask that question is that people uh, oftentimes ask the question of what about long-term impacts? Is it possible to have a reaction to this vaccine months down the line or years down the line? Um, with previous vaccine, the answer is unlikely. Uh, with this, this vaccine, we don't know. I would guess that the likelihood is less with this one only because it's far more rapidly degraded than other vaccines because the, the material it's made out of, the mRNA, is very easy to degrade. So we don't know whether there's a, rea a body has a reaction to the vaccine that becomes latent or hidden that may only manifest itself months down the road. We will know very soon the answer to that. Even the patients who are um, enrolled in the phase three trials, even those people will have some follow-up data on. Plus, we have all of the people who are now being vaccinated, which is essentially part of the phase four data, the, the real world data after the vaccine has been released. So we will hopefully have information very soon. For, for people who are thinking about getting this vaccine or think want to get this vaccine, what's, and, and, and they're, they're talking about you know, side effects and reactions and stuff, what's a worst case scenario for a vaccine that's been approved when you think about side effects? You mentioned earlier the um, Guillain-Barre syndrome. That would be one example of the worst kind of side effect that we've seen in the past associated with uh, vaccination. The Guillain-Barre um, side effect is extremely rare still. Um, it's in the range of perhaps one in a million or around that. Um, it might have been higher in that, in that specific incidence in the 1970s with that vaccine, but since then they are, it's not common. It's very rare. The other important thing to recognize is the vaccine that caused that, the flu vaccine, it prevents the flu illness. Flu itself can also cause neurological complications, including Guillain-Barre syndrome. So when you're considering the risks and benefits, as you mentioned, of any vaccine, you have to consider the risks associated with the disease itself. So if there's an extremely rare neurological complication associated with a COVID vaccine, if that is the case, that has to be weighed against the likelihood of you acquiring COVID and the probability of you developing long-term side effects from COVID. So it can't be judged in, an, in isolation. It has to be judged within com a comparator. My last question for you. I like to ask all of our experts this question. What advice, do you, have, <laughs> uh, what advice do you have for people who perhaps are curious and want to learn more about this vaccine and want to keep up with the latest? Yeah, I would recommend going to reliable sources and read about the vaccine, read about the data that was released, and read about the approval by Health Canada and the CDC. So this is all publicly available, the Public Health Agency of Canada, the National uh, uh, Council for Immunization in Canada, and NACI it's called. Uh, you can also read about the CDC's assessment. Um, I think it's very important for the public to be educated about this and make a decision for themselves. My personal belief is that after individuals do educate themselves and read about it, they, are like, they will be convinced that it is safe and should be taken. But it's important for everyone to make that decision for themselves. Don't take the word of experts or other people. Re read the data, read the assessments, and to think critically about the situation. Yeah, I guess with the UK, Canada, and the US all approving the same vaccine, Pfizer, and the rollout happening um, the last couple of weeks, and as we move forward, then we're going to be learning a lot more in the next couple of weeks. Exactly. The, the post-marketing surveillance, um, you know, people are going to be very attuned just to side effects and that, that will be reported to health bodies if side effects are seen. As, you, as we already saw that, I mean, we already saw that last week with those two individuals who had a history of an allergy, they themselves had a severe allergic reaction to the vaccine that was immediately reported. So I think the public can be reassured that this information is very, very rapidly reported back to the drug company and more importantly to the health bodies who are monitoring the vaccine.